Hello and welcome. It's the chat. My name is Manny. Guess what? I've got her. She is Nigeria's foremost actress, television presenter, and a cosmetologist. Born into the Awori heritage of the western region of colonial Nigeria, Lagos, Taiwo Ajayi Lysert is a Nigerian theatre matriarch, journalist and cosmetologist. She was born on the 3rd of February 1941. She attended the Mount Carmel Covenant School at her hometown in Lagos before proceeding to the Methodist High School at the same location. Subsequently, she moved to London to study business and administration, but in the process, took courses at Christian Shaw School of Beauty Science, where she received a certificate in cosmetology. Thereafter, in 1969, she obtained a higher national diploma in business studies from Hendon College of Technology, London. In the course of her study, she worked as a waitress, a senior secretary and a personal assistant for various companies. Taiwo officially left her corporate career in 1972 to join the Travers Theatre Group for the Edinburgh Festival and in no time made appearances on several television and stage productions. In 1973, she featured in Amadou Madi's play, Life Everlasting, at the African Centre London. She also featured in an episode of the hit comedy in England, Some Mothers Do Have Them. <laughs> Upon her return to Nigeria, she landed roles in iconic productions, including Lao Lo Guni's Wings Against My Soul on NTA, Tenso, an award-winning Mnet series on DSTV, and recently in 2016, Oloibri, directed by Curtis Graham, which stirred veteran actors like Olu Jacobs and Richard Mofeda Mijo. This theater matriarch received a National Award of Officer of the Order of the Niger OON by Chief Olusha Gobasanjo and was also honored as a leader of British African theater in 2008. The 79 year old free thinker lost her husband in 1993 and has not remarried since then. She is a voracious reader who is obsessed with education. to the program. Thank you for having me. So good me. to see you. Just looking at you and I'm thinking, my goodness, you haven't changed that much. Really? And you are nearly 80 years old. I'm almost. Almost. Well, I'm just 79. Wow. What's yeah. left of 80? <laughs> just a couple, a couple more months. You went to Methodist Girls High School. I did. The prestigious uh, yeah. secondary school. What, what did you pick up from school then? Sports, really. You were a sports I was a, woman. I was a sprinter. Really? Uh, yeah. I, and at home, I used to do boxing as well. I was a tomboy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, all of this, you ended up reading public administration. Yeah, and, business, uh, yeah. Yeah. So after that, what happened? How did it come about, you know, you getting into the entertainment I business? Well, I, I then started working in the civil service in England, uh, uh, post office. I worked with the postmaster general. I worked with Lord Hall, the chairman of the of the post office, and uh, and I just went with a friend. I, I went for a friend to take that person to coffee, and a, a producer, the director of a play, uh, in production at the theatre, the Royal Court Theatre, Sloan Square, London. Uh, he was going to possibly to the loo and passed. Uh, uh, passed me sitting in the foyer and, uh, and wondered whether I was an actor. But uh, no doubt because of the way I was dressed. Oh, is it because you were also black? Because I was also black and I thought I was Nigerian and I must be an actor. And I said, no, I wasn't an actor. I was just here to wait for a friend to, to go for coffee after rehearsals. And he said, would I like to join? So I went on holiday and joined rehearsal. And we opened, and all hell broke loose. 
and rehearsals. It was all cast. What do you mean by that? All hell broke loose, you know. People lined up as my, my, at my... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at this at the stage door at, yeah. the, uh, uh, at the dressing room door, wanting to know who my agents were. Yeah, but, but did that begin your journey? Yeah, into the entertainment industry. That's how it started. And then what happened? Uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth Alan Jeffries, who, who owned uh, Premier Management, signed me on. And uh, the following week, I was at the BBC working. What's the producer's name? I can't remember. Asked me, Michael Mars, to come and see him. And I was working at the BBC. Uh, the Thompson organization, who were running Daily Times at that time, signed me on to be writing a column for the Daily Times. That's how my... Uh, journalism car career started. Everything started. I was, what I said, everything, all hell broke loose. I meant that. Uh, in areas I never, ever dreamt of going. Uh, and I had to, uh, I was doing that. And then I started broadcasting every morning on the BBC, certain programs with Alan Stewart and whatever. I just shut up. At what stage did your husband come into the picture? Because uh, oh, apparently he is to a large extent responsible for you. Much later. Yeah, okay. Much later. So, I, and I, all this was happening, and I thought, I'm not an actress. These people are going to find me out. I'm a fraud. <laughs> I said, yeah, because the way they were, the way everything was blowing up around me, and I, I decided uh, I'd better go train. So I went to City Literary Institute. I got myself mean? a coach, personal coach. I started when you were a baby, uh, learning you to be an actor. Spot, I started reading. So, but you left the corporate world, didn't you? Yeah. And I eventually went full time into stage. It was my, uh, yeah, my husband was responsible for that. People sought me out and uh, invited me to come and play at the. Dublin International Festival. That was great success. Uh, my husband came to that, traveled from London to Dublin for the opening night. I well, was what, very what were you talking about your husband? Had you married her? I mean, no, they married we, we, were then? we were married then. Okay. We were not married. Uh, uh, that was, uh, it was my boyfriend. Yeah. Why, my, why, why did you? fall in love with him at that time? Is it because of himself as a person or because he was a white man? Because of himself as a person. He was a bibliophile. So, so, so tell me, what role did he play in, uh, in your career? You know, I just, I'm just interested in knowing that yeah. he played an important role. In a your... pivotal role. He was in oil. So he went to Venezuela, he went to Jamaica. The, the first week, the following week, he was traveling. He traveled and we were always talking on the phone. That's how we fell in love. Oh, really? so, so when he came back six months later, uh, he said uh, he didn't want a girlfriend, he wanted a wife. I didn't want to get married because I just, I just come out of a divorce then. And then, as I said, he came to see me in, in, in this show and said, <laughs> you must forget uh, all what he called all the extracurricular things you're doing. You should concentrate on act acting. You are an actor. Because he said, when you came on stage, everybody was, rivet every eye was riveted on you. And uh, at that point, we, uh, it was a play about Lumumba. I'm very political. Uh, and they just killed Lumumba. And I was playing Lumumba's wife. And in the play, the, somebody is supposed to have broken the news to me. And I asked the producer if I could do a dirge. And mm. so I did a dirge. Do you find it easy acting here in Nigeria? Or are there sort of uh, technical problems that you feel could slow someone like you down? It's a challenge, yes. But then that's what it's all about. That's what being creative is all about. You must find a way around it. You must deliver. If you can thrive in, uh, in the atmosphere we work here, 
it's like Lagos driver. <laughs> like the Lagos driver. Yeah. So if you can't drive, drive. If you can drive in Lagos, you can drive anywhere. anywhere in the world. Yes. If you can do what. But, but that's you... bad driving, though. Yeah. A lot of that is. Yeah, that's you know, what we're saying. There are, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a analogous because you're, you're not in the same environment. You should be producing good work. But yet, you must produce good work. You don't have any excuses. Mm. And you are a feminist for, for, for oh, that I am. matter, you know. I what, still am a feminist. What, what makes you so? What makes me a feminist? Because I don't like the way women are sort of treated as second class citizens, for one thing, and the way that women themselves accept the diminution of their well, own role. But did your parents not teach you that in, as you're growing up to respect your husband, respect, you know? You know, what, what's wrong with that? My mother said to me, said to us girls, said to me in particular, that you were not born for any man. That was significant to me. So you don't tie your life to a man. You must live your life. And that means, it's, uh, that's not as bad as it's, it sounds. It means you must make your own contribution. You're not a parasite. You do not depend on a man to live, to breathe. I think it's, it's unworthy of all of us to raise our girls, to, to make them feel that. All they look forward to is getting married. Girl children must face their own destiny and not feel that somebody has to pick up after them and be a parasite and be a burden on a man. I'm a feminist. One of the reasons I'm a feminist is we raise our boys from the time they can think to tell them that they have responsibility on their shoulders. You're going to get married. You're going to send your children to school. So men are running around trying to look for school fees. Some women are they're capable of doing it, but they're not because it's been told to the men that that's their business to do. So they're going to look after the woman. Even if she's earning her own money, you've got to be giving that woman money. You've got to pay school fees, worry about school fees, worry about keeping your children. And then the extended family uh, uh, comes into it. You men are raised for all, with all this burden on their, on their shoulders. People don't understand feminism. That's why they're against it. Feminists want to be able to live and enjoy a man. But the men die off with all this emotional, psychological, physical, fiscal, economic pressure on them. Is it any wonder they can't perform? So they die. This thing, this point that women have that I own my body, I can sleep with whoever I like, it's erroneous. It's nonsensical. I remind them. And a lot of them are the religious. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God? You don't turn your temple into a sex pit. I thought you were talking Family about marriage, you know, mm. before, you know, the... Was that... That wasn't your first marriage, was no. it? What happened? You know, the, there was a marriage before then. I was and married it, twice before I married my husband. Oh, really? You're not really good at it, are you? No. So why did you get into it in the first place? Ah, I was a teenage mother. Yeah. I was a teenage mother. My father was uh, very strict. He said, well, if that's what you want to do, you must get out of school and you must get married. So I was forced to get married. I had my son. And then he died at the La Lupin train disaster. I don't know whether you guys know about the La Lupin train sure. disaster. I mean, it's I've one of our that. major national disasters. Train disaster, I remember. Train disaster. Mm. We lost a lot of yeah. wonderful minds. So, so your first marriage was with a, 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 was he a black man? But of course, it was a Nigerian. A Nigerian? Yeah. My second one was a Nigerian as well. It didn't work because we were in England, and he said that the two of us, uh, uh, that he was the only one going to study, and uh, it would study for both of us. <laughs> exactly. I didn't have to, so I was working, supporting him to train as an accountant and everything. And I said, no, where I come from, when you go to England, you went to study. I want to study. 
and that created tension between us and it was physical and everything. So I said it wasn't my husband because anybody who was going to be my husband would have ambitions for me. You pick a question and uh, read it out and uh, answer the question. Okay. Yeah. All right. What and a challenge. Uh, what a challenge. What am I going to get? What am I going to get? Ha. <laughs> huh. That's amazing. Is it? It's the third question. And it says, what's your take on the prevalence of violence and rape against women and children? That's not a feminist question, is it? It could be. Right, OK. One of the reasons where the feminists, fem, the, one of the things feminists are saying, don't get your men into such a stage mm -hmm. that they are they're so lacking in self-confidence that they, they, that, that they rape women in order to, uh, because you've raised them with this superiority complex that in order to, to feel themselves appealing to women, they think they have to dominate them by rape. Rape is a political statement of domination of man on woman. And if you raise men in certain ways where they feel they have to do that kind of violence on women, it's very sad for the society because you have raised psychopaths. What do men see women as just things to use? What do they see themselves as? Because, I mean... That's how we socialize them. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. We socialize, and women are responsible more than anything else. Okay. Because that's how they were raised as well. So they're passing it on. A lot of us think that all we have to do... Uh, you look at what's happening now. Women, when they got turned to 35, 36, they're desperate for a husband. It's not, the, it's not just the biological clock. Because everybody, there's, in fact, too many uh, uh, one-parent family for my liking. It's not, it's not healthy for the society to raise children without mother and father. You can't have children who don't have a father figure. Just because you're, this is what feminists think is being feminist here in Nigeria. I own my own money. I can look after my children. I don't need any man. That's terrible. What about the children? What kind of children are you raising? How much work do we put into making a relationship work? That's what I'd like to know. Some of these marriages are arranged. Do you know that? Yeah. Why do you agree with them? Arranged marriages. Arranged marriages can work. They can work? Oh, yes. Because love, if people are intelligent about uh, uh, the relationship, Love develops. And at the risk of just laying myself wide open, I went into a marriage like that. Yeah, personal. I've been living at this level of thinking for a long time. After my first marriage and my husband died, a friend who knew my husband met a friend in England and said, I know this girl. She was married to a friend of mine, and he died and everything. He had, this other man had just arrived in England, wanted to study. Why don't I introduce you to her? Now, that other man then wrote a letter to me here. I'm doing evening classes. I'm trying to work out what to do with my life. I'm trying to work. My father refused to send me back to school. So then I got this letter saying, this, I've been talked. Some, a friend of mine told me about you and everything. Are you game to come to England and marry me? This is 1960. Nobody arranged my marriage. I arranged it myself. I went to marry a man I'd never seen before in my life. But I thought. It was brave of him, even at that age of mine. To venture, you know. To venture into that. And I was game. I'm always game for anything. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. I'm a seeker. 
I've always been a seeker of knowledge, but he had a different agenda, which was why I said he wasn't my husband. He wanted somebody who could work to support him to study. He wanted a scholarship. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's been on for, for, for ages. Oh, you know? yes. Really? Oh, yes. Nothing wrong with that. If he was intelligent enough to then accept the person he invited into his life, he thought I was, oh, Lagos girl, too uppity, they're too, too this, that, and the other. And he was going to tame me and was going to make me uh, just work, support him. And then when he finished, we go home. There were many women who did that. And at the airport here, they handed them over to their parents. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you are a Nigerian. Come to think of it, have you had thoughts about elections and uh, politics in Nigeria? Did you play any role at all? I don't. Why? What are your thoughts about Nigerian politics? You know? Absolutely in the gutter. Who is? You or the politics? Yeah, politics. <laughs> We are failing our people. We have not politicized our people. We have not educated them to have, to, to have. When are we going to start? Because every time we always talk about we have not. When are we going to start? Uh, we start by yourself. Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change you want in your world. But we are essentially scapegoaters. We scapegoat. When are you, you said, when are we going to start? Because you, we're waiting for somebody else to start it. We don't know that it starts with us. You have to be the change you want in the world. I'm living here, you see the area. It's a political statement I'm making. It's a rundown area. It's a slum, quite frankly. Why do you live here? What, what sort of statements yeah. are you making? Because I am the politician, because I can deal with my neighbor one on one and tell them, don't degrade your environment because this is what is doing to you. Don't wait for the local council and they can bear me out. This is not the responsibility of Asso Rock. But why are you not a councillor? You know. Who am I talking to? Do people know that that is the way councillors work? They don't. People go into this because you want to make money and we have sort of socialized our people to believe that if you go into politics, you want to get, you want to see your container come. What is success? The care, caring for other person. Fairness, equity, honesty. Compassion. I feel, for instance, proud. And one of the reasons that I feel so confident, I married that man. I helped get his education together. That's in my consciousness. That's what I did. He had a career. I had a divorce. The court said I should get a, an alimony. You know what I did? And how old was I then? I said I didn't want a penny from him. I did what a wife should do to her husband, for her husband. I'm very serious about these things I'm talking about. That's what a wife does. He didn't use me, I was his wife. And in a marriage, whoever it is that can keep the marriage going does her duty. There was no, they don't need a crown or a, a, an award for that, for being a, his wife. I was his wife and I did my duty. I said, well, you, uh, you trained him to be, I said, I don't want anything from him. Quid pro quo. He got me out of my hole. He was in a hole. He needed somebody to help him out of his hole. I was there. I've done it. That's it. He's not going to be giving me alimony. If he's doing that, he can't enter into another relationship. And every time he sends me a check, it's going to be with a curse. Well, because you're limiting what he can afford, what he has to manage his new relationship. 
I don't want to hinder his new, his future. Thank you very much, Taiwo, you know, for you. being on the program. Thank it's you. It's been nice talking to you, really. Thank you. It's been a I've, pleasure. I've appreciated every bit of this discussion with you. Thank and you. And that's how it's been on the chat this week. My guest has been Taiwo Ajayi Lysit. I am Manny. See you next week. The Chat is produced by Channels Television. You can watch it again online. Just visit our social media platforms, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Thank you.